Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, this session is um, Finding Truth, um, Technology and Big Data. And um, we're now um, in a highly transformative time. Um, we're 100 years into um, the development of, of propaganda, F Freudian, social dynamics, and, um, and now the development of advanced technology. So we have a, um, a very interesting team here that um, can address this um, from a variety of different issues. Um, um, Shen Tang, who is um, a serial entrepreneur, um, has been involved in a variety of internet startups, is currently involved in a portfolio of sustainable foods um, with his company, Food Future. And um, Shen is a longtime activist and um, was um, one of um, the student activists at Tiananmen Square um, and um, has um, some um, profound um, knowledge and background to share with us um, on his history. Um, Lisa Gus is um, a collaborator of mine. Um, Lisa is the CEO of a blockchain business, um, Kanish.io. And um, the work they're doing is focused on um, advanced technology and, um, and trust systems. So this is where we start, you know, looking at technology as a foundation for building trust systems. Um, Amy Seidman is a um, entrepreneur and is um, the founder of Noble Profit, um, a technology company that focuses on um, success metrics um, around the sustainable development goals and the understanding of how to properly use big data now as it's becoming available to us to, um, to direct outcomes um, and, um, and to help supply chains and, and social systems move ahead. Um, Shai is um, the founder of Diamonds for Peace. And um, that is an, a fascinating organization in terms of that starts to challenge our understanding of, of value and truth in value. Um, diamonds themselves as a market have been a manufactured market, have been core to our economic history, to the history of the British Empire. And now to start to define um, better practices or humane um, supply chains within the diamond industry um, is a critical factor. Um, so, um, you know, I come to this as a anthropologist, as someone who's been involved in um, media. I worked for large um, ad agencies my entire career. Um, I found myself involved in Occupy Wall Street um, um, close to 10 years ago and helped to facilitate Occupy's involvement with the United Nations. And um, I'm an open source advocate. Um, I believe that open source systems, open source collaboration at this point in time can be transformative. And I believe that it's extremely hard to find truth um, in this society now. How do you define what is sane in an insane world? And I think what we've been going through these past few months has really helped to clarify for all of us to take a step back and you know what is going on around us with new eyes. Um, the Sustainable Development Goals, for instance, and, and the focus of the 17 goals um, is um, you know, to help redefine our path forward. But as long as the 18th goal, which is ending extreme wealth, um, is not there, it makes it very difficult for the other 17 goals to succeed if they are going to succeed. So, um, you know, with that said, um, let's let's kick off the discussion. And um, uh, Amy, do you want to um, 
not follow up on this and um, offer your side of the story and, and your um, truth? What, what is everybody's it. truth? Yeah, okay. Well, you know, you talked about a lot of things that, that I think are, are definitely um, of concern right now. And we're looking at a lot of our rights being um, shifted around and, and concern about our health and our, the global implosion. And so we have this opportunity to rebuild the future. Um, and we have choices that we can make um, of transitioning different systems. And so I think that there is definitely a need for truth in terms of where could all of this great wealth be going? How can we start to shift this flow of resources to things that help the world? Um, and it, can people become wealthy in a way that enables others to as well? When we look at money, there's supposed to be a replicable quality where $1 is $6 and, um, you know, each time it's, you know, kind of spent within the community. And I think that we have an opportunity to create new governance systems and to pattern this truth with new technology. Um, so, and we can talk more about that. Um, but I definitely believe that transparency is something that we need. Um, and there is the power of the voices of the masses. Both the internet comes with a lot of um, manufactured information as well as the opportunity for people to galvanize movements. Um, and we've seen that with Twitter and you know the whole revolution in the Middle East. There, there have been some definitely a couple of different incidences where um, social media and technology has helped uh, propel truth or helped you know groups of people. So, so it's like fire, it's a double-edged sword of, of what we're choosing to do it with it. Um, and I think the big concerns right now have to do with our rights um, and misinformation and everything's online and you know everything's going digital. But knowing that there are techn technical capabilities to help protect our truth and actually take back our truth and take back our personal data um, and the opportunity to do that exists today. So I'm excited about that. And I agree, we have a lot of work to do, but we can come up with new systems and this point that we're in is, is inspiring a lot of new thinking. Um, so it's really what we do at this time. Thank you. Uh, Ted, you're muted. Okay, I'm unmuted now. And um, to follow up on that, yeah, solutions. Um, Lisa and I have been working on a couple of projects that are, are pointed at solutions. Um, we came together um, three years ago and started working on what is now the seafood ecosystem. And that's a blockchain based um, trust system for the seafood industry. And um, the concept of scaling efficiencies of the seafood industry in large bioregional development. And we're also now working um, on a um, um, COVID um, tracing application for um, a community-based application with an organization called Silicon Harlem. And that features trust. Um, how do you use a trace system um, in an inner city, um, in a community that naturally doesn't trust authority? And um, Lisa, um, you wanna talk about trust and blockchain and truth? You know, yes, I definitely do. And first of all, I want to speak about it as a daughter of all things. Um, my parents live with us and my dad, well, he came into the US as an immigrant, just as I did. And we were obviously just very justifiably leery of propaganda and of having truth being messed with in terms of how we would actually consume the truth and how we would know that truth in fact exists. And so when we came to the US, it was really amazing and eye-opening to see the media unencumbered and media being trusted. Yes, it was, you know, occasionally bad mouth, but at the, most of the time you knew that what you would see on TV is more, more than likely at least approximating, you know, what's going on. And then came YouTube. And then came the fact that my dad retired and started watching YouTube. And I have since gotten horrified, honestly horrified about the vacuum 
that is being created by social media. You know, I think maybe the idea is, has been awesome when you think about it, feeding you the kind of content you want, but the road to hell is really paved with good intentions because right now my dad is literally in hell of Google's making. He's finding out the kind of things that he really, really shouldn't be finding out because they're patently untrue. And there is no way to trace it, no way to track it, and no way to get him out of this um, ridiculous eco chamber that exists. And so having a chance to cure something like this with the technology, with giving people a chance to regain their self-sovereign identity and their sole self-sovereign right to get the access to the unvarnished truth, to the truth outside of the eco chamber. I mean, I'm grateful to be where I am today and I'm grateful to be working with people like you guys and with Ted and everybody to actually unearth the truth again and make sure that it doesn't stay lost because until we know the truth, no changes can be really made. Because how do we know what we need to change if we don't know what's going on in the first place? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And Shay, would you care to offer your perspective on truth and, and value? I mean, uh, diamonds, uh, that the focus for me around diamonds is, is value. W where does value come from in our society? And, um, you know, diamonds and gold are at the heart of that, aren't they? Or they have been traditionally. Well, uh, my discussion about truth in diamonds is not only about value. I think that value is created by human beings. And uh, another thing, uh, the critical thing in the diamond supply chain is that uh, diamonds may be sourcing the conflicts or terrorism activities, but we never know. And there's a certification scheme called Kimberley Process which is established by the uh, encouragement of the United Nations after the civil war in Sierra Leone to prevent the rough diamonds to be circulated to source uh, the conflict. However, almost all the you know, uh, rough diamonds go through the Kimberley process, but the reality, uh, it doesn't prove anything. So we don't know which diamonds are financing the terrorism or conflicts and which are not. So it's it's quite difficult in the diamond supply chain. And yeah, and the technology will be helpful, uh, like large companies uh, introducing the blockchain to trace uh, the, the, the whole supply chain. But it's very costly uh, for the artisanal diamond miners that we are working with and it's it also have some issues. For example, if we have a blockchain technology in the diamond uh, small mines and they register the diamonds to the blockchain, right? But what if they bring diamonds from other mines and just register the diamonds as if they mine from that particular diamond mine? In that case, the false information will be carried to the consumers. So yeah, I think yeah, that, that's one of the problems we're working on. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Can I can I actually um, just bring in some information that I know about that? Um, Everledger is a mm -hmm. uh, is one of the solution providers for blockchain around diamonds and they actually each diamond as I understand it has a unique fingerprint. Um, and similarly, I've heard of um, some DNA testing. So I, I think they're really trying to work on that. But yeah, dirty data in is dirty data out. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, thank you. I'm aware of the evaluator and the provenance proof. And uh, yeah, that technology is great. But I think we, the human beings, also need to be, uh, need to have integrity to use that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I have to say, as a blockchain entrepreneur, I my company once was in discussion with another company, a large one, and when we were, uh, talk, were talking to them about trust and truth and transparency, which are the corner, cornerstones of blockchain, I was immediately asked, but what if people lie? You know, what, what are you going to do with that? 
how how is it useful then? And that actually has made us pause. And in the end, the answer has been, you just need to have some faith in people. You know, you could um, track and you can build a reputation and you can maintain that reputation. But beyond that, I mean, human beings are still the end and be all of oracles. When it's time, we're actually answering some of this in the technology we're building and, and looking towards all the different groups that are doing these verifications to define the particular use cases and then having these different checks and balances. Like right now, we're working on cotton and supply chain uh, around the Uyghurs and, and this terrible thing that's happening in China, which we should definitely good segue probably for the other speaker uh, who has been a part of the Tiananmen Square. Um, but there's, you know, the big concern is how do you vet uh, this cotton from coming in through Thailand or through Cambodia? And so it's really about triangulating information and in some cases even doing DNA testing, but I don't know if that's possible with data. But I think there's a number of ways that you can start comparing to historical information as well as like, you know, how much did you buy? How much cotton did you buy? Or how, much, how many products did you, do you have receipts for? And then what are you actually selling? Um, and so, and then you have whistleblowers um, and reports that might be made. Uh, and so it's a combination of things and, and people are gonna cheat. They're gonna find ways around it, so. So as a segue into, um, into Shen now, um, and, um, and where there is truth, um, there's truth in what we eat and the food that we eat. And, um, and Shen has spent his life, you know, looking for truth and, you know, in different areas. And I know now, um, Shen, what does all of this mean for you? Well, I, uh, I grew up in Beijing, you know, um, in the, and now I'm going to date myself because Ted already did. Right? I was an uh, activist uh, during Tiananmen, that's 31 years ago. I couldn't be two years old being a student leader then and being the first political exile coming out of the national leadership. And I was lucky actually uh, to, um, to be exiled six days after the, uh, the awful, the, the, it's not only a bloody uh, a massacre, no as a Tiananmen massacre, but it's also unfortunate that's how the world remembers. This is one of the mo most amazing periods of human history with uh, over 400 uh, cities and uh, over 150 million people peacefully demonstrating and nearly changed uh, the Chinese history, the Chinese regime. Therefore, the world, is, the world will be different today. And you've seen in the last few decades that uh, there's some 30 regime changes. Most are just from this kind of groundswell and Occupy Wall Street for different reasons, but similar right? with, uh, with this grassroots groundswell and, and changing the national dialogue, at least Occupy achieved that, Occupy Wall Street movement. But, but immediately, uh, both as I grew up in Beijing and right after this very dramatic uh, uh, exile um, following the Tiananmen massacre and, and the massive purge in the, in the following years, there is a war of truth between the, the West. Uh, and for a long time, actually, the rest of the world and China, to the extent that China is a country of amnesia. This billion people, 1.4 billion people collectively uh, do not talk about, and the majority of the population now, I mean, literally about half of the population or more, don't really know that two months, that three months even happened. So uh, that's interesting. Look, look at something a little closer. Just a few days ago, we have yet another direct election, believed to be direct election in Belarus, one of the former Soviet Union Republic, right? Where it's clearly the public sentiment is one way and the count of the votes is 80% for, the, uh, for the, 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 what's known as the last dictator of Europe, right? But look at something closer. This is one of the things about more, I mean, more um, gray area of truth. And, and the last speaker, I think Amy uh, mentioned about whistleblowers in the West, I mean, I find it very interesting that uh, even with people who are strongly supporters of uh, major human rights, uh, uh, viol human rights violations in, in other countries, sometimes some of them, or oftentimes some of them, 
become silent with domestic uh, Western industrial countries, uh, human rights uh, and, and social equality problems. And more severely, you look at uh, Western countries where what's generally uh, believed by what's called the free world as uh, free, uh, free elections and constitutional democracies we have because of the data and, and the big data and, 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 the, and success of social network age of, uh, of marketing and political campaigns. You know, there's, there's plenty of uh, examples of why 2016 election in this country, my, my exile country, now my, my country happened, right? I mean, say the, the movie Big Hack talked about you know, personal details and graphic details about how that happened and similar elections happened in the Philippines and, and other places. So, um, and, and Facebook, uh, among others, uh, played a major role in that. And the one thing that closest to home to everyone in the world today is the truth about COVID-19, right? And, uh, and, and, and all of this lead to something really interesting because we're in a, such a polarized, politicized situation about what's generally modern society considered as information and facts and, and science. Uh, and scientific data are so polarized and politicized that I idealize, uh, you know, I, that, that there are ideologues around those topics that uh, the, the very pursuit of some basic questions start to disappear. Did everyone notice that with all the suspicions about whether it's a man-made uh, or human-made is COVID and where it's from, it's a Wuhan lab, it's, a, it's a, in New York, I, I mean, Manhattan, you know, that's many come from Europe, where should we still call it China virus? Has there been really serious any discussion about patient number one? Which is of course the topic everyone should talk about, right? So we're moving away from the, the, the very starting point and foundations of uh, fact finding and truth definition because of polarization of this, right? So, um, so a lot of this become a matter of belief. It's not a matter of fact anymore, right? And, uh, uh, and this is true about evolution. This is true about organic or regenerative uh, agriculture and food versus industrial ag, ag and food. This is true about global warming, I mean, especially in this country, in the United States, it's a matter of belief, right? And um, so, so then, you know, to, to the second topic, other speakers and Ted already mentioned is about, so what about technology? Is technology value neutral, right? I, again, you look at Nazi Germany, you look at North Korea, look at the, 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 the China I grew up in and China today, technology and, and look at the current uh, sanctions about uh, kicking out kicking a uh, TikTok off uh, out of the United States and banning uh, Huawei G5, right? Because uh, that chips, that issue is highly politicized, of course, but there's a, there's a good reason to believe uh, uh, communication fundamental platforms can easily change elections. And not just the example we talked about, a lot of other examples that are, there are reasonable suspicions about that. So technology platforms are not value neutral. Um, and uh, uh, that's what the liberal world tend to believe, that more communication, more conversations will promote liberal ideas. And then, then it comes to question on the religious level, ideological level, and human bias and social psychological level of bias. Like, for example, is liberal ide ideology, is the Protestant Christianity more equal than others? Right? And we face this problem in Europe, right? with, with the Muslim population, we face, face this problem right now in the United States, as what's generally considered white populations is increasing become the minority by sheer number, right? Other religions are the minorities. And we have an ongoing radical social movement right now about, about racial uh, equality. And, and, and the last I would mention is kind of a individual and human or psychological bias, like a success bias, you know? Like I personally it was, was religiously uh, believing in nonviolence, and but during Occupy Wall Street movement and during the more recent and unfortunately tragic uh, Hong Kong protest movement, my belief got is more challenged because uh, what if there's a perpetual uh, hopelessness about protest and uh, and the failure of nonviolence protest, right? And there, there are success of Gandhi and Martin Luther King, but during Occupy 
the young kids will tell me or tell Ted, you know, that won't work. And uh, it's hard to say they're wrong, but it's easier to say they were not wrong in Hong Kong, just uh, what's going on right now in Hong Kong, right? So I guess I'm taking way too much time, but, um, but this is, uh, but there is hope, maybe we'll get to that, uh, to, the, to the second part of the conversation. I, I think there is hope and, and to, um, I'm not sure how much time we have left. Uh, we started late, but we probably have time you know, for quick response and around. And uh, Shin, it, what, what comes to mind is, as you're going through all of this, um, I, fundamentally, we are locked into the Hegelian dialectic, um, advancement through conflict. And that's been the foundation of the two-party system. Um, and it's the, um, the, uh, the thesis, uh, the, the, um, the thesis, the antithesis um, resulting in the synthesis. Conflict um, moves society ahead. Um, Eastern views, um, Taoism um, is to be in accordance with the way. And I think fundamentally as we look for truths and as we look to move ahead, I mean, for me, what what came out of Occupy was a movement that was looking to be in alignment with the way, the way of the universe, the way of the Tao, as opposed to perpetual conflict. And, and I think that choice in a lot of ways becomes a fundamental truth for us. With, with, and you guys care to respond to, to that well, element I, uh, of how deep- may the, may the fourth be with you. The, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, I, I, you say, I wish I had the Hegelian uh, certainty, you know, dialectic or a, a more linear uh, progressiveness as uh, Fukuyama would say, uh, end of history, right? But, uh, but I, I, I just tell a, a quick, hopefully a quick story what I caught myself of, 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 of all the spies that um, the, if I objectively, object as, as much as I can to watch human being homo sapien as a species within the interconnectedness of, of earth. We actually, by, just by data, by the way we interact with other biomass, we behave like a virus as a race, right? But for years, you know, the, the, I think I, I, I would say I had this well-meaning approach to save the world. And I remember this is at Paris Accord. In Paris, I was on the master stage. I was talking about talking, saving the world through food, agriculture, and impact investing, I call myself on stage saying, Earth will be here. We're here for a quarter, quarter century, right? But Earth will be here. The way we were killing the speed, other biomass, half of them, right, in the last 50 years, literally half of them, right? And it's about our own, own survival. This, you know, this is such, such a kind of um, like human-centric bias that we were thinking about. So, so this consciousness certainty that the Hegelians and other system builders like Hegel or Marx or the uh, Scottish uh, Enlightenment that inspired the founding of the United States, right? That certainty itself shapes certain frames of how we even define truth, which may be, um, which, which may be a question now. Oh, wow, I have a lot to say about that. <laughs> First of all, I totally agree with a lot that you were saying. I, I've often thought that we're like a virus, um, you know, attacking our host and, and, you know, now we have to go out to space and colonize uh, asteroids. I mean, God, you know, the, the checks and balances in nature, if we brought much more water back, what would happen to our environment? You know, it's like, I don't know how much water the, the earth would be able to contain without more sea rise. So, you know, the more we mess with it, it reminds me of, um, I, a long time ago, I was a photographer and I did a series in a volcano crater or volcano erosion compression called Haleakala in Maui. And, it, and a big part of the topic was this endangered seabird because people had brought rats and then they put in the mongoose to try to get the rats and they didn't think about the fact that they existed on opposite ends of the, of the day, you know, one's nocturnal and the other's diurnal. And that, um, you know, like you said, good intentions pave the road. Someone else here was saying good intentions can be paving the road to hell. Oftentimes we don't realize what our outcomes are. 
Um, and to that effect, uh, in the same way, you know, nature has these checks and balances, you know, we're going to get wiped off the planet if we don't stop thinking about the biodiversity that we're part of this interconnected species. And I spent many, many years, uh, you know, looking at how I could use my skills to perpetuate, you know, the joy and the love of nature to realize it's all about the money, you know. Uh, nobody cares except the dollar when you think about who's controlling it. And so when we start now to see this flow of like these trillions of dollars in divestment, it's so exciting to me because a third of the world's wealth is being committed towards things that help the planet. And then all the GDP is starting to move towards sustainability. And with that, you need this checks and balances. You need to have you know, there's going to be people who are going to cheat. And so how do we start creating transparency around that? And so we're creating a, a verification system that also tracks SDGs and uses blockchain as this anchor point. And it's really all about the verifiers and how do we create a flexible system, but kind of connect it so that there's networks of people talking to one another instead of all of this hoarding, you know, I'm going to have everybody in my, you know, domain and over here, you're going to have everybody over here. And, and, and I think there's a remarkable thing happening with media in, in this polarization as well, because on the one hand, it's keeping us from, from being in touch with each other. And even more so with COVID, it's connecting us. But, you know, before that, we were not socializing. You know, we're using uh, all the social media to kind of connect with people and then not pick up the phone and talk to them or see them in person. Um, and yet it's also an influencer, you know, you could have big brother, but then you have people who are getting, you know, kind of seeing a glimpse of what society could be like and having those influences and, and actually shifting where it's probably harder now to uh, contain thinking within these cultures. You know, there's VPNs, people are accessing, you know, movies that might be banned in countries using these different, you know, types of systems to kind of bypass uh the negative stuff. So, in any case, um, I, uh, I, I think follow, that uh, Amy's uh, opening point. I, I think that's yeah. also that last point, which is money. Let's follow the money, right? So the yeah, reason follow the money is, uh, you know, instead of uh, you know, uh, you know, left China and just seeking a, a new things to, to do, but I eventually I fall in love with food because what I learned during both Tiananmen and Occupy, a large movement, impactful but ultimately failed movement, is this moment of expansion when it is not only uh, uh, feels good to be on the right of history, but it's also safe. So, you know, like uh, uh, that's why food, I, I see food as a, as a consumer behavior, as a direct democracy, we can vote with our dollars. And it's so interesting to watch from the big money perspective as, as a number of speakers alluded to that. You know, I just compare big ag versus big agriculture versus big food, right? There's so much less resistance from big food companies, these are giant companies, right? hundred billion dollar companies, right? And they're and, and uh, they're they're actually trying persistently to to join the new uh, new trend, right? So so there's the direct democracy. People can vote with their dollars how they consume food. That's really a sense of hope. How to we how we stop individual and collective behavior like virus, right? And I, but I also like, doing that, yeah, covers climate change because regenerative economy is but the fastest way to suck carbon out of the atmosphere so they can accomplish I mean, all I, of I, that. I think the areas we, we uh, you know, our innovators are working on that the sustainable uh, intensification and uh, uh, regenerative smallholders, plant-rich diet, uh, mm -hmm. reducing food waste, nutritional matter, mm -hmm. all of that, just those, those categories together can reduce 20% of the greenhouse gas. That's nearly 200 gigatons. So that mean, meaning, meaning one fifth of the solution, this is all can be 100% consumer driven. One fifth of the global warming, meaning that we will, you know, five times of that, global warming will stop, you go back into the pre-industrial temperature. And as far as we know, we're, we're, we're pretty much safe, we can, we can play again, you know? So, so there's, a, there's a real hope there. Yeah, and, and through large scale bioregional development, we can um, affect major change in the oceans. Um, um, large areas of the oceans can actually be turned around in 10 years, um, if there was a coordinated international effort to do this. 
and and the real problem has comes down to the fact that there are no organizations that are in a position to make this type of needed effort happen on an international level. Um, the Council on Foreign Relations um, is aware of this, the United Nations is aware of this. And, and our position from the seafood ecosystem has been that um, new emerging collaborative technologies will allow for new forms of governance. Mm -hmm. And um, that you know, is a foundational approach for transformation now. Um, and um, Initially, it started as the seafood commons. Um, and the, the understanding was that 71% of the planet is outside of national boundaries. Um, how do we move into the needed post nation state governance um, that you know, is now evolving? And how do we do that in a trusted way? And I think we're probably you know, at the point where you know, we've fulfilled most of the time that's been allotted to us. And um, if we could go into a round of wrap ups now, um, um, Chai, Lisa, um, if you guys have um, some comments and, um, and, and then just um, leave everybody with some truth. I'll yield my time without taking too much. <laughs> well, she's, they said we could talk as long as you want, but ladies, let's hear from you. I'd love to hear about the seafood stuff that you're doing. A lot of slavery in seafood too. Yes. Oh, um, well, for my part, uh, we had actually come into the blockchain space because we could see um, there is there was no sustainability in the way we did commerce. Uh, because you know originally we were in publishing industry and we could see Amazon destroying it from within, basically destroying the venture uh, the, the vendor ecosystem from within, and eventually it just become unsustainable for publishers and eventually from, from producers of other goods and services to continue being a part of Amazon. But at the same time, Amazon here in the Western world is, you know, sort of end all be all. If you're not on it and you're producing something, then very likely you're going to lose an opportunity to exist as a company. So it's sort of a, instead of a win-win, it's a lose-lose situation. And that's what we wanted to change in the blockchain. And that's how we came to meet that. Because I think he could also realize that we, you know, our society overall has become its own Amazon. We are destroying our own ecosystem from within. And until we recognize that truth, you know, uniformly, then we are going to be in a really bad shape because eventually the same lose-lose is going to truly encompass the entire nation. And of course, then you see such efforts as I recently read about 17 investors coming together um, or I believe uh, are worth about $16 trillion, um, throwing their lot into sustainable ecosystems and sustainable investment into companies that are following uh, their developed guidelines. And that gives me hope because, you know, it sounds like that truth is finally being recognized and there is a way forward. Uh, whether we're going to be able to take it on time, well, that remains to be seen, but it's nice to see that there is hope. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, is Che going to speak? Because I could respond to that. I, I think I think that we have a responsibility, all of us, to do everything we can to scale up this uh, next generation of of what we're doing. Um, you know, we we have all the knowledge and we have the the time now. We have the tools. We don't have excuses. We just have distractions. So yeah, and I'm excited. I mentioned that in terms of hope, that uh, it is not only millennial, but even more so, more completely Gen Z. And my father of three, uh, New York teenager. Well, the youngest is ten, but I feel like she's been a teenager for a few years. But uh, they, <laughs> they, they, they're born uh, environmentally conscientious. They're the Grata generation. And, uh, and uh, again, Ted, I, I totally understand and to relate to you know, when it comes to oceans and what's going on in, in Galapagos now with the Chinese uh, fishing fleet, right? And, and there's so many other injustices, not just in the 
Chinese ships and they started this after Europeans and all that in earlier decades is that the uh, there are there are not just for individual uh, feeling good and, and but there are large areas of solutions I mentioned and, and food and consumerism and voting with dollars but this is not just food it's, it's, it's many different areas where I think the the, uh, the behavior shift the cultural shift is taking place in a very significant way is two youngest generations right the Gen Z and the millennials and it can be done I'm just I'm just so encouraged after two major failed movements uh, and any man, many others I mean Tiananmen and Occupy Wall Street in terms of changing China to be democratic and making U.S. less money in politics we clearly failed on those two things but the food movement is not only a delicious one you will, be, you will succeed but it's an example of a consumer driven behavioral cultural shift that could really uh, change paradigm. Yeah, I also see a change and uh, there's a good sign in the younger generation. Uh, but uh, I'm in Japan and uh, I don't know about what's happening in the States so much, but uh, usually many Japanese just believe what they are told to. So it's not so difficult to, you know, to give them false information and make them believe it. So I think consumer consumers awareness raising is very necessary, especially in Japan and and for uh, and then critical thinking. Because when people see the information, they just believe it without questioning. So yeah, so that's my my comment. I don't think we're alone. <laughs> Fox News, you, you hear people repeating, you know, mantras and on, on both sides, you know, people pick up memes. I think it's part of how we're wired. The key is to, to be awake uh, and see through that. So I think, you know, for me, the closest to the truth that we've come so far is um, um, you are what you eat. Um, and I'm not sure that we, I can sum it up any more concisely than that. Well, right. I'll, I'll, I'll add it uh, that, 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 especially with the ocean concerns and everyone else in, on this, uh, on this uh, really interesting panel, is that we are what we eat, eat. So there's a... <laughs> uh, what we, yeah, what, what our stuff eats, right? Yeah, <laughs> Pesticides or the yeah, yeah, plastic. And the endless stories about that. And always we think we're eating organic, but what about the soil health that it's actually translating into lack of nutrition? Uh, you know, there's uh, there's uh, takes uh, five oranges to equal to one uh, today in the in, in the U.S. Right? It takes uh, uh, you know sometimes a hundred potatoes equal uh, to one in organic fifty years ago wow. in the United States. I mean, so 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 you know they, that, that that's how connected directly we are beyond what we eat, but it's what they eat, the plants and animals. Yeah. What's interesting too is that you have the drawdown, uh, you know, pointed out they had all these scientists come together and kind of rate, uh, hundreds of scientists uh, rate what are the fastest uh, paths to climate change. And we were talking, you were mentioning, you know, one fifth is regenerative, uh, you know, the regenerative space pulling climate out. Um, and when we think about small businesses, uh, you know, big ag for years and years, you have the Dust Bowl of the 30s. Um, it's kind of interesting how we're moving back to these small farms uh, because that's the answer. That's the answer for the economy too. Startups, small businesses, family-owned businesses, and they're kind of reverting to these old paradigms. I think uh, technology can help us get it there. So you're gonna have to send us that chat to all these great things coming in. What I've just dropped in now to, to wrap this up is, um, talking about the oceans, this is one of the most important videos that I've come across. Um, and um, it's a discussion on the case for farm fishing. It's a 17 minute video and, and it explains some you know, fascinating things that the future of protein of the oceans is in reinventing farm fishing. And that people think that wild caught is better is more natural. Um, we need to know that there's no such thing as an organic wild fish. If you go out fishing, you have no idea where that fish has been. 
You have no idea if that fish has been you know, swimming in front of Fukushima for the last two weeks before it went wherever it is now. You don't know what it ate. Um, you know, so wild caught is not healthy. It's not what people think. And current farm fishing is destroying the oceans. We have the technology. Um, it requires funding. It requires a global effort to enhance and redefine this industry. Um, but we know how to do it. And it just requires now the effort, you know, for impact investments to um, identify and, and help move best practices around the world. This yeah, is true. Yeah, an example, uh, because Ted is saying, uh, take your time and bring it now, or bring it. Uh, but I'll try to follow, follow our leaders here. Um, the, uh, um, you, you, you can see that uh, the organic uh, trend which is probably the most sustained and most visible and certainly by volume, most successful trend in the food agriculture and consumer space, right? Organic food, right? fresh organic food. But, uh, but in recent years, something really interesting happened and that's, that's actually coming from the space about, uh, about uh, truth. Local, oversold organic. And the trend is not stopping because that kind of circular local accessibility, not just physical accessibility, but knowing our farmer who is close by is, is in, 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 so, so the, the, uh, the consumer awareness shift because you cannot unpack anymore a global supply chain about where food come from. Just like we cannot, there's no way to break down an iPhone, but you can always by cooking, knowing what you're eating, right? After sourcing, right? So there's that kind of a very simple uh, psychological uh, uh, alignment that uh, that in a way I would I would say millennials and Gen Z are the generation young right I mean they're they're the ones shifting supporting local farmers they're the ones shifting toward uh, better for your snacks there's the one like my children knows that they can go to any store get any food uh, as long as just one catch less than four ingredients printed on the packaging they know that it makes sense to them, right? So this doesn't require the big guys to behave. And here's the difference. I look at the, 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 the much challenging agriculture activists before us, we're food agriculture, right? They get death threats from the, the big eggs and the big farmer now, right? They're the same, right? But we are, we are I mean, for now, five years into do, doing food innovation, I pretty much received delegation, not only from the governments and regional, uh, you know, the, the, the entire organizations, but almost all big food and most of the big act, sending delegations, trying to figure out how they, be, they become part of, how they stay relevant. So individual consumer can make that big difference while policies and big money are lagging behind. So, so that's where I think grassroots actually shine. It's better the grassroots act first. So there are those areas and they matter. Yeah, I think it's coming from all sides. I think that the pressures are coming from, from every point. Uh, you know, the consumers, the people, the employees working for these companies, they don't want to work for the, the evil empire. They want to work for a good company. And then the, the investors, you know, going to pull out the stock. I don't want to be a part of it. And, and then new companies not getting funded unless they have these kinds of principles behind them. Um, so I think you could apply a lot of this thinking to every aspect of our lives and everything in it. Um, basically, how do we, how do we go back to the beginning a little bit? And then how do we use the technology that we have been, you know, creating and coming to this place in time and create these hybrids? You know, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. We can go back to things that seem to make sense and we can optimize it so everybody's afraid of robots and i think you know maybe it just leaves more time for us to paint and you know the ability to not you know be able to send your kids to school and having them work in the fields uh and then you know our world shifts so we have that opportunity it's exciting yeah and and, and on that note as long um, as you have a universal basic income i think we would be good you know yeah that's something we also need to discuss, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm moving back to the future and, <laughs> and, and understanding that um, a lot of the indigenous philosophies, principles, worldview, um, it was grounded in a, in a sense of being with nature. Um, you know, we assume that, you know, the buffalo were just here, that the Amazon was just there. But as we are learning now, um, these are generations of permaculture farming that brought the Great Plains um, and the, that abundance to the Native Americans. Um, the Amazon, that was generations of, again, permaculture and crop planning to make the Amazon as rich for a, a food basin as it was. Um, you know, so we need to go back and look at certain skills that we've lost um, in becoming civilized. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a time to move forward and, um, and to look at our roots to find balance to move forward from. Thank you so much, Global Both Summit. skills and the wrong So on that, I guess, um, shall we um, say good night to everybody? Good morning to everybody. It, it's, it's sometime somewhere around the world. Goodbye, everyone, and onwards. Yes, it is. Yes. Have yeah, a good thank time. You. Thank Have you, Global day. Summit. Thank Bye -bye, you, all. Global Summit. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.